Welcome back everyone to TNO The Last Days of Europe. I'm your host, American Mocha Lover. And right now, we are almost ready to finish the Time to Save America focus. Because right now, we're attempting to pass a bill into law to save America. You know, we want America to succeed no matter what. And right now, with a smile on my face, we don't need anyone else's support. Because all 51 of our uh, far-right party senators support the bill. So we don't need the Republicans, we don't need Democrats, we don't need the center. So... It's time to save America, my friends. And uh, for my understanding, to make sure that this is the most gamer episode of Wallace I've ever done so far, we should do the left side of the street. Make speeches throughout the country. And you native sons and daughters of old New England's rock-ribbed patriotism. And you sturdy natives of the great Midwest and you descendants of the far west flaming spirit of pioneer freedom. We invite you to come and be with us for you are of the southern spirit and the southern philosophy. You are southern as two and brothers with us in our fight. And thus President Wallace will embark on a massive coast-to-coast -coast campaign to promote Antra. He will tell Boston housewives that his act will keep their children from being bust to uh, black schools, tell Michigan auto workers that he'll keep uh, blacks from taking their unionized jobs, and tell well-to-do New York suburbanites that without Antra, it would be there goes a neighborhood in no time. And then he'll tell them to write their congressmen and urge them to throw their votes behind the only act that can save America from chaos and destruction. Oh boy, this is going to be really, <clears throat> this is going to be a, a wild episode. We'll put it like that, especially early on with what we're uh, <clears throat> planning on doing. So. Yeah, we'll see about that. Well, we'll see what happens. Um, that everything we do in this this episode or just this campaign period doesn't necessarily reflect my own personal views. It's just I love the meaniness of it. I'll put it like that. And MPP is looking good. The RDs don't really care for each other. And also, we just finished off a uh, lowering black market trading here. So, uh, what else do we want to do? And there was a couple comments from the last video saying that man, Iberia is like, why do we keep getting help? Save black from people helping to stabilize the country all the time. And it's because I want them to join the OFN, or at least get observer status, but we'll see what happens, because it's currently led by... Oh, Salazar. Hello. Open the council. Uh-oh. Oh, boy. Everything's probably going to be for naught, but A, it is what it is. And actually, we can probably close this one, too. Very nice. And people are still extremely unhappy <clears throat> with the lack of uh, segregation uh, legislation, but, you know, it is what it is. There's not much we can do. It's January 25th, 1968, so Happy New Year, everyone. All this does is suppress the unrest, not fix it. You think these so-called freedom riders are going to quit now that the R CRA is passed? You think they won't be burning down your cities thrice over by the end of the decade? Give these uppity Nazi infiltrated activists an inch and they're going to take a foot in your whole leg. The CRA may have mollified the, the black people for a hot minute, but Antra will strike at the heart of their unrest by giving your boys in blue the means and the mandate to shut down the riots before they start. You mark my words, pass Antra and it'll save your life. Wallace will dial his law and order rhetoric up to 11. He will denounce the CRA. As a broken law that weakens every sheriff in the country and promotes Antra as America's last hope to save themselves and the property from an onslaught of civil riots. Rioters. Cool. So this will help please everyone who wants uh, <clears throat> segregation, but then campaign for the repeal. Finally, time has come for the president to begin to collaboration with his cabinet in regards to pushing forward true legislation to generate a better society within the U.S. Wallace was pacing in his office as he ran through the ideas within his head, as Vice President LeMay finally came to the door to begin their meeting. What took you so long, Curtis? Wallace asked, fidgeting as he went to stand over his desk. Gathering the reports you wanted, sir? LeMay said as he dropped them all on his desk. Yes, just what Wallace wanted. The president eagerly flashed a toothy grin towards the map he saw, with red circles drawn around several states within the country. These, sir, are the prime states to focus on if we were to initiate such a campaign. The South would be the most sympathetic to a cause. Thus, it would be most beneficial to start there to upswell support before heading ever to over different areas. What do you think, Mr. President? Wallace let out a slow laugh as the graphs and maps and records with images of the possible future ahead of him dancing through his, uh, his mind. The Civil Rights Act burned out of American law forever, allowing him to pursue every bit of the push punishing legislature he wished to create against the uh, darker-skinned folks. Those degenerates have been plaguing this country for so long with only a few darn words I'll have to tear apart to let me solve this once and for all. Wallace up, but then dreams turned to worry. What if it's too much? What if the risk of riot and protest endangering the lives of the true patriots of America, who aren't worried about such notions of equality and fairness? Those dudes were dug in, but then Wallace thought about just how entrenched he would become if they were to fight back. He had been to war before, literally and metaphorically. He could handle a few protests from criminals. Um, sir, are you alright? Let me ask, interrupting the inner thoughts and cont contemplations of the president. Scheme, scheme, schemes, but just how much were they worth it? This means everything. We can survive without all of this. Another journey, another choice, moving up in the world. Um, it sounds like it's going to divide America more. <clears throat> so we'll see what happens. 
The list goes as hardly the most obvious place for Wallace to seek support. Yet his analysis see a window of opportunity in that bulwark of progressivism. If he hits the right moves or notes, Wallace could convince even the enlightened liberals of Beverly Hills to see why Entra is necessary. Wallace will make it clear that desegregation isn't just something that will happen in Alabama. It'll happen in California too. The Black Panthers are already using a force of arms to terrorize the good people of LA, and it's only a matter of time before they emboldened or they're emboldened to torch Watts and the whole city with it. If you don't want to be defending your homes, families, and businesses when the ba police abandon you to the mob, you'll tell your congressman to vote yes on Entra. If you like to read about this, please go right ahead. This happens every single time, so. And class 3 Senate election season. Cool. Keep America strong. Vote R&D. Nope. Alright, so the Deep South is a toss-up, huh? Oh, this is very weird. The East Coast is tilting towards NPP, but the Deep South is <clears throat> a toss-up. So, we're going to go with Deep South. I really wanted to get all this stuff done before the civil rights, all the civil rights stuff done before, you know, the election year, but whatever. We did get back Hawaii, so. Civil rights caused chaos. The president sat down with Arla Bird again over to go over the reports handed over by the local, state, and federal authorities across the country. Everywhere they looked, they saw a similar set of circumstances. The enforcement of the segregation policy had grown stronger, prompting a reaction of protests. Now, with the cycle continuing, these protests were growing bigger, bold, bold, bolder, bloodier, and uglier. <clears throat> Now, metropolitan areas throughout the U.S. were consumed in protests while burned and rioting. This is going to look horrible if we gave in to these miscreants, these criminals, Wallace said, obviously flustered over the state of the country in the face of these dangers. My entire party and those beyond who give support to the administration are banking on the cracking down on this liberal nonsense. Who wants these people around if they're just going to tear everything apart anyway? Not only that, but the economy is bound to tank with the cities under fire like this, or like they already are now. Wallace rubbed his forehead with his venting. <coughs> Well, sir, we already have law enforcement units en route to contain the protests and order them to maintain a level of containment over the surrounding areas which have been affected by the protests. Furthermore, while police units have been issued to the larger cities in order to suppress the riots and clean up any of the damages, the perpetrating groups appear to be far from finished. In regards to their actions, having said that, federal authorities are asking for permission to go on the offensive to safeguard the streets. Most prominently, Sacramento, New York City, and Denver have seen the worst of the riots, and the nation's law enforcement are being deployed to these areas to put an end to the riots. Wallace had known that these people were furious, destructively so, now. But he knew if no one stood for the riots and traditions of the white America, no one else in the government would be strong enough to do so. With strength, we shall prevail. Not bad. Yeah. Mm. More states' rights. Uh, reassure the NCPP, huh? All right, dig digging into Dixie. Wallace had already cleared the schedule he would need and organized the caravan he had traveled with. Presidents of old did it. Why not enjoy the ride along the way? And thus, the president journeyed side by side with the key members of his staff, and even his wife, Lorene, the South, the president's home, was a gold mine for support of such an act, and it was such a, just a matter of time before they'd get the work done. The campaign train formed a circle around the entire South, allowing them to quickly hop from capital to capital in an effort to make sure everyone knew of the importance of repealing the gosh darn Civil Rights Act. The president's journey began in D.C. itself, where the president captured the attention of the public in his announcement of his journey to win over the hearts of the people so that they never again would be burdened by unnecessary legislation like that ridiculous CRA. Next, the president traveled out west from West Virginia to Missouri before heading southwards to the farmlands of Texas, where crowds cried out to meet the president and his wife, and more importantly for Wallace, tuned in to the unfairness held by the CRA. The crowning jewel of the trip was when he reached back home in Montgomery, Alabama after heading eastward, where he dined in the city hall among some of the most powerful southern senators, representatives, and governors in a televised event broadcast to drive the people of America to get their senators to vote for repeal. Finally, Wallace journeyed up the eastern seaboard until finally concluding his, the trip back into the nation's capital, D.C. Their marching bands and cannons greeted the president as he drove in, along with thousands of southerners who had crowded the front of the White House. There, the president rose to a high podium to deliver a fiery speech regarding the beauty that is a green jewel of the southern United States before returning to the theme of his journey to get on the butts of his senators and representatives and tell them to repeal the darn act for your freedom, liberty, and your independence. Wallace's screams dominated the area, giving rise to the thunderous applause of the southerners who came to witness the sensation. That evening, President Wallace took but a little while to relax and enjoy himself, thanking his wife for going with him the whole way and making, such, making it such a nice trip. It was, if it was that easy, this is going to be a piece of cake. Maybe I should have, you know, campaigned around the country for that. But hey, it is what it is. I'm not sure that's going to help us or hurt us, but oh well. Campaign in the West, my friends. And we... Oh, what is that? Purple? Bur oh, look at that Burgundian system. Walter Davis, who is that? Hello there. <clears throat> it's going to pass regardless, so... Wow. Look at all the House of Representatives. That's looking really good. Um, the West Coast. It's still not too bad for the MPP. So, yeah, I still keep, do keep doing this Deep South... Towards R.D. New England, 
NPP, 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 NPP. Just, it's really weird that the Deep South, they're extremely unhappy just because we haven't passed any segregation stuff. So, um, actually, can we do this? Are we... Yeah, yeah we'll do this one against Germany because we can. Make it a little different, right? Cool, after that, get back in your place. Martin Luther King Jr. styles himself as a reverend, a so-called man of God, guided by Christian principles. But I, George C. Wallace, am a servant of Christ as well, and I call upon this reverend to consider two important passages in our scripture. Deuteronomy uh, 32.8 and Acts 17.26. <clears throat> when the most high divided to the nations the inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of children of Israel. For one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out the appointed times of history and the boundaries of the lands. In 1964, the American people confirmed an immoral truth, that the, the separation of the races is a God-given mandate to mankind. It was not President Wallace who first put up signs saying whites only and coloreds only. It was our father in heaven. <laughs> no no one, not the God-hating fascists in Germany and Japan, the tyrants on the Supreme Court, and the spineless atheists in Congress, nor the satanic Burgundians and their liberal elites. Funding them can erase what God has decreed. The Civil Rights Act is ready to be melted down like a modern golden calf, and America will return to God in the way of life that he ordained. God gave our Negro citizens their proper place, and Antra will return them to where they truly belong. Man, this is going to be a spicy episode, Jesus. Uh, maybe even have a spicy title along with it. A diner in downtown. The forecast hadn't said anything but about the chill struck in Ohio this morning, but thank God he made it to the diner early so he wouldn't be struck out uh, in the open snow like all the unfortunate men and women. With nowhere to go outside, poor dudes, thought Colton, as he dumped a few tablespoons of sugar and started mixing the sweet smell in a coffee. Finally, his roommate made it into the diner after an hour of waiting. Where have you been? Colton asked. I decided to give a few dollars up to these folks. Who cares? Colton filled with... Anger and frustration as he saw the newly soon red star in his friend roommate's leather jacket. Austin, what the heck do you mean? Who cares? We have rent to pay. Gosh darn it, you're in school and my job doesn't pay me enough. I've already ha have Pam up my butt about me not making enough uh, crap. Colton said, kicking the ground. Now you look at me, dude. You and I are both pissed right off about Wallace already. Heck, he's the first. First, he's let all the people get screwed out of their jobs, and now he's going to go around the country saying African Americans got to get shut out of modern society. Uh huh. Look. You can say the Republicans, but I realize that we need some folks who really want to get change, <clears throat> change out. Austin said, while lighting a cigarette. Hey, they got good omelets here. He asked. Uh, Colton leaned forward and told his roommate, "If you really think that the people you're representing are going to make you be able to afford a sausage, you can forget it." Look, Austin. I mean, no one, no man, woman, child, white or black, no one deserves that sort of treatment, especially from the president of this beautiful country himself. However. If you think you're representing a bunch of communists who want to tear apart the Constitution is going to help anything, you're wrong. Wallace is a radical son of a gun, but you got to remember, if you represent them, and it goes somewhere, you're just representing a commie Wallace, one who's going to have the businessmen of the country on the streets like Wallace as the dudes on the street. My apologies about that. My cat wanted out. So, finally, the two breakfasts arrived, and they ate and warmed up as best as they could in the freezing Ohio in morning. Look, I'm sorry about it earlier. I stand by it, but I'm sorry. Can you just drive me to school before work? Austin asked. Always, brother. Always. <laughs> and repeal the CRA. <laughs> In 1962, the President of the U.S. signed into law the most monstrous piece of legislation ever enacted by the U.S. Congress. It was a fraud, a sham, a hoax. Never in history has this nation had so many human and property rights been destroyed by a single enactment of the Congress. It was an act of tyranny. It was an assassin's knife stuck or struck in the back of liberty. Oh, we give it to independence. Oh, yeah, we already did that. And today, God willing, God willing. It will be shredded down in the waistband of American history. Entre will come to a final vote today. All of Wallace's prepare, preparations to secure the repeal of the CRA shall be tested. If it passes, Wallace will cement his legacy as a savior of the South. If it doesn't, his failure will never be forgotten in Dixie. Repealing the Civil Rights Act will, be, will unleash a storm of racial unrest, and the center block of the MPP will scream bloody murder. The party might not survive, Entre, neither may Wallace's own presidency. None of that matters. This moment is exactly what Wallace had fought for ever since Nixon signed that accursed act. And by God, he should not be denied this victory. Alia Yakta Est. Kennedy's legacy destroys Entra and Congress. Nice. And I did pause the game to read that just so we could do some more of this, too. Um, yeah, everyone but the Deep South wants this. So, Upper South? Eh, yeah. We'll probably do Upper South because that's a toss up there. Nice. <laughs> I love the far right senators. Oh, good lord. Oh, man, this is going to be wild. Nice. Also, um, also, so after yesterday's episode, I went back and played just a little bit more, like I normally do. Some, uh, so I, I sometimes do, not always, sometimes do. And uh, I did not choose a meeting with Harrington, just because 100 political power, it didn't do anything for us last time, really. So 
and we're already like really unified so I thought it was okay to just go back and not click on that option uh, let's see because we're still very unified and you know what I just noticed look at this it said three or now there's 13 Democrats I love the Democrats I love the Democrats <laughs> now we have 64 senators supporting our bill other times finished nice job guys nice job now with this this should guarantee us pretty much victory in the south like they don't like us that much because we didn't pass so much legislation but oh, we need oh hold on NPP NPP yeah not bad not bad safe NPP safe NPP oh boy I would really wonder like with us passing this how bad we could lose support hopefully we don't and we'll cut this down as much as possible we have over half a trillion and nice so after this um, we have to be strategic about what we're going to do oh Salazar's gone one can deal you down we're going to immediately go ahead uh, and probably do this one but we have to do American businesses next the far right of the NPP has begetted, begged the great George C. Walls to reform the American economy into one way or another into creating a truly free and capitalistic market through which the patriots of America will thrive. Instead of crying about their loss of welfare programs, however, while we should continue to act as strong men and the greatest voice of the far right for America, what we have to do is get their answer for ourselves a simple question. Shall we act in the favor of the small business time, small time business owners of this country working hard every day to make things right, or the true money makers sitting in the suits of the fancy corporations, bringing in millions from foreign investors? across the world oh boy what do we do answer soils Kennedy's work through Congress oh boy the US of A a land of countless prosperity and endless variety has found itself in a near political standstill of the following the events of the federal government today there within the congressional halls of DC the Senate moved by the prerogative of J President George C daddy Wallace approved the American National Traditions Reservation Act also known as ANTRA a repeal law against the Civil Rights Act nullifying its legal effects within the US countless citizens look on into the future with fear and awe as the social sphere of the US stands completely changed with some saying for the better while others saying for the absolute worst President Wallace and the entirety of the cabinet has issued full celebrations regarding the victory within the Congress as the issue of the existence of the CRA was one of the initial issues of President Wallace's campaign and eventual success to become the president. The U.S. is a land of culture, tradition, and moral values. Meanwhile, obstructing its Americans' rights to enact these pillars of culture, such as segregation, as a direct obstruction to the American dream itself, maintaining segregation and putting an end to the CRA was a drastic issue I declared to solve within my presidency and issue the solve the issue I did as the end of the Civil Rights Act is a crowning achievement for all of my administration and I recent reports indicate marches all throughout Montgomery Alabama cheering the Alabama president in his successes against the Civil Rights Act others however maintain a sense of terror as, and dread as they think about a future without the Civil Rights Act with notable instances of entire families of African Americans locking themselves away in their homes America's our home just as many as any other red-blooded Americans get to say it's their home and it seems that the head of our household has decided to cast away one of the house's children from safety and security, said one African American, African American worker who was found eating at his favorite restaurant in fear that he would not be able to come back in a long, long time. I want the name of Wallace flying across the country. We can continue repealing it. Man, this has been a wild uh, presidency. Winning in South Africa. Actually, you're not in here, right? Oh, look at that. Legacy of the Air Empire. Cool. Um, we finished them. We freed Indonesia. We, pa we repealed the Civil Rights Act. My goodness. This has been a little wild. Anything else down here? They're on. Okay. Oh, they're unhappy. What do you mean you're unhappy? Play up our achievements. Goes further divided? No, I don't want to do that. Uh, I want to make sure that we are still united with <clears throat> the NPP. So let's go and do this one because we have enough political power for this anyway. So they're working well together. Increase unity. Now, American society is united after we just got rid of the Civil Rights Act. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm dumping just so much money into these guys. Nice. Anything there? Nope, that's fine. <clears throat> so now, let's see. Yeah, there's not... So, okay, so... Oh, uh, actually, let's take a look at this. Anything for else for civil rights? I don't think there is, which is totally fine. Um, if you don't have enough senators, like if you don't have 50 or 51 senators uh, for the far right or just the NPP, like, there, there's, like there's a special event where there's like an Arkansas massacre. So... Because we have 51 senators, we don't get the event because I think you might be able to get impeached and stuff, I think, for stuff like that. I don't know. We'll see what happens. But we can't get impeached if, you know, <laughs> if we have 51 senators. So it's as far as I remember. So, yeah. Deep South. We'll probably do Deep South again. They like us a little bit more. So, man, this is a, this is definitely a timeline, isn't it? Nice. Cool.
Who knew clicking buttons would have such interesting results? Ah, cool. Better M16 A1s, nice. Death, Supreme Court Justice. Oh, they were a liberal, look at that. Uh, let's see, he's a liberal. There were several notable opinions throughout their tenure, occurring in de dissenting. Oh boy, you know, we gotta go one way already. And this will help make sure that we don't ever get impeached. <laughs> oh no. Oh boy, this is wild. <clears throat> After this one, we do need to do lower business taxes, which will alienate the CNPP, and we want big business sell. What American businesses need to grow and improve this nation is simple and clear. More capital. The first and most intuitive step to ensuring continued growth and more jobs will be freeing businesses from the unneeded financial burden put upon it by the government. Especially since we've all agreed that the federal government needs some shrinking anyways. Polls are updated. Cool. Which we'll check about check out in just a little bit. <clears throat> Alright, the crux of the economy. Wallace had known the nature of the National Progressive Party from the days he registered into the party. Frankensteinish being the most appropriate term to apply to the menagerie of the political movers in the U.S., looking to make change with disappointment after disappointment, coming from the Republicans and Democrats. However, President Wallace knew the day would come in when he would have to decide on defending American competitiveness or pleasing his support by sticking it up for the little guy. However, little did he know that this decision would come with a discussion with Wilbur Mills. Well, you see, Mr. President... <clears throat> Your beginning statements are fire, sir, and a fantastic way to draw in support from to cheer you on and set the crowd to spread support for you. However, as I navigated down the paragraphs, I no noticed a bit of inconsistency, sir. Mills said, inconsistency? What the heck are you talking about, Mills? Wallace said, moving over to try to look over the speech. You see, sir, the points you made within the body seem to come off as, well, inherently contradictory towards one another. In one paragraph, you greatly appeal greatly towards the larger businesses and corporations for producing thousands of jobs for good Americans, while further down you make a note to point out the strength and power of the American workforce and being able to resist falling into business traps that suck the independence out of every day of one's life. It just isn't possible to do both, sir. And quite frankly, it's down to a matter of choosing a side regarding the statement. <clears throat> as, such, as much as Wallace hated to acknowledge it, but he was going to have to come to some side to choose a side regarding the economic argument on behalf of the far-right MPP on one hand. The big business leaders in the U.S. offered unparalleled growth for the economy with the slashing of federal restraints and could offer much greater opportunities for Americans while pleasing the conservative body of America who wanted the market to remain as free and open as possible. However, on the other hand, there lie the key to a monstrous success regarding the suing together the factions of the MPP while also managing to please the Southerners who didn't give a darn about the larger businesses so much as supporting themselves on a local level. Mills and Wallace sat for what felt like hours, as the unbearable tensions of the party-changing decision was set to rock the U.S. Mills had really become a central part of the grand economic plan, as President Wallace himself stated. We need the progressives and local businesses on our side. The corporations are too profitable not to capitalize on. You know what? I'm not here to maintain, like maximize growth, so we need the progressives and local businesses. I want to make sure that we can win, and the big businesses are going to hate that, whatever. But, yeah, we, we got to make sure we can win. So, let's see. Oh, the Deep South is more mixed. It's a little better now. But the Upper South is more mixed. Southwest is more mixed. So the Rockies didn't like what we did. So so it's pretty much a leaning victory. California. Oh, man. That's not good. We have four more days so we can wait. Uh, actually, the Local Business Relief Act. So 9, 14. Oh, yeah, we got it. It's secured. So 60, 74, 76. Jeez. Wow. 74, if I can add, see, that's 60. 60 plus 16 is usually... No, 60 plus... 76, yeah. Uns oh, come on, man. Uninspired campaign, that's not cool. Uh, uh, I'm not even going to read this. We're going to go with this one. So, snapshots from Stonewall. It's quite quiet night in Stonewall Inn. Barely anyone notices my scribbling notes in the corner. This corner of America is obscure, but it shares a tendency for achieving or aching introspection. Abbreviated loneliness hammered out via cheap glass cups. Beyond the occasional whisper and the wordless glances, not much makes it out of the haze of anonymity. Anonymity. And, may it, and long may it remain so. The haze is the only thing that separates this part of town from the moralizing glaze of the rest of America. It's the only thing that keeps it safe. As I'm writing this, a pair of young men in their 20s, perhaps. One Latino, one Caucasian, are swerving to the aching beat of satisfaction. Their pattering shoes tap out a rhythm at once familiar and strange, just irregular enough to inject a vitality while keeping pace with the beat. The body trace patterns so bold they'll be scandalous anywhere else, but here in the trace of lips and hands on waist, it achieves careworn familiarity, like an elderly seamstress fixing an old cardigan. If this had been a different country, perhaps they would have become dancers. But the lipstick and the gaudy dresses they wear would kill their careers, and a lot more besides in this one. America is home to the brave, but this land isn't free, not for some, not yet. For now, there's the freedom of the swirl and curve of the dance, the celebration of the joy of life in a world with so little else. Another man offers his hand, and I rise to dance. And in this gentle rhythm and the smoky swirls, I sense some vast and gentle ecstasy, and with every sway, I come closer to its source. Life thrives in the strangest of places. Well, I don't know if it's really strange to do it there. You know, it's probably the New England metropolitan area, so. 
then again it is putting our social a attitudes I'm putting them onto you know back in the earlier times doesn't always work stay in the course uh, if you like to read about this goes right ahead I mean this has happened like three times already so we definitely can't get a beach now look at that Gus Hall's here Yaki's here and we have maybe one more year maybe 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 not no let's see no not really cool you gotta keep campaigning nice yeah it's not looking good um well the Rockies we might want to do the Rockies the upper south definitely needs it the deep south should go for us but east coast I, I want to get at least 51 still I don't know if we can actually keep that though let's do the let's do the east coast maybe Uh, Central East Coast. There you go. Well, this will pass a bill. That's nice. Lower business taxes, job subsidies. Big business sense likes this. Um, the Jobs Act will pass a bill in the law. We do need to do foreign businesses, of course. That will skyrocket. Uh, let's see. Anything else down here? No. I need to increase the unity in the country before we, you know, do stuff. I'd like to do is throw the steel belt. National campaign here and add with this stuff. Let's see. Money for entrepreneurs. New businesses, so business subsidies. Cuts are not enough. Business needs needs more money. Still, and money that they can invest in more ambitious projects and spread out through the economy for all to enjoy. Sadly, this money is what they simply cannot gather through the normal day-to-day -day operations. Hard-working businessmen of America, your cries have now been answered, and the years of neglect have now ended. The federal government must now play a more active role in business. So, good. And we did that one. Oh, we have this one to do. Nice. Cut that down. Libra makes a buck in Congress. All right. The notion of owning one businesses has been a staple in economic culture of the U.S. throughout its history. Through time immemorial, people refer to the U.S. as being the land of plenty, where anyone could do anything they wanted, all while making the success for themselves and the families that they desired. President George C. Wallace has shown his desire to uphold this notion and has taken a step towards promoting the land of plenty ideal through the Local Business Relief Act, or Libra, which offers an immediate flat tax relief towards local businesses and their owners, cutting control of the U.S. federal government from its economy further. While some praise President Wallace for their intentions to create an independent economy, others find it just to be a whole to fix in a leaky economic crisis. The far right has joined the Democrats today in celebrating a potential victory in the name of a free market, as small businesses have already rushed to work hard and produce more than ever before the tax relief. Just down the street from the, the, our news station, a local grocery market grocery market store owner was seen rushing to the business with a truck full of appliances and registers to upgrade the efficiency of his business. Libra is a culmination of logical reasoning behind President uh, Wallace, says Treasurer Wilbur Mills in a press conference today, and we'll, we will continue to take these down steps for the sake of the American people. <clears throat> However, the state of American economy following the Local Business Relief Act has not caused happy cheers for all. So stock owners have begun to notably scramble their investments following the act, as local investors' offices have continued to receive phone calls regarding the shifts and changes in future American finances. Meanwhile, public welfare advocates have assembled en masse to combat support for the act, with one Republican leader saying, America doesn't need to open more pitfalls regarding the help of its people and government. Wallace wants a free market, but how can people participate if they're too sick or hurt without a place to get help to work for it? The freer the market, the freer the people. Nice, we get a lot more political power. But we lose a lot of money, so... Honestly, that's not bad. The 1968 Republican Democrat primaries. As it all come down to this, a few days ago in the International Amphitheater in Chicago, Illinois, the primaries are over, the delegates have been selected, and it's now just time to see who will lead the RD party into the 1968 election. There are now only two visible candidates in a race that has seen many trying to win the keys to the White House, Arizona Senator and proud firebrand conservative Barry Goldwater or Ohio Governor and fame astronaut John Glenn. For months in, TV, in debates on TV and radio, at rallies from coast to coast and in living rooms over the dinner table of everyday Americans, a battle between Barry and John is rage. Pins with their faces and slogans like, In your hot, you know he's right, and sold to the new hats with glam. Posters, newspaper ads, cardboard hats, and all the memorabilia of a campaign seeking to win the chance to be the RD standard bearer. Both are claiming that only they can end the anomaly that is the NPP's George Wallace, who now sits at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. The first non-Republican, or Democrat, to hold the highest office in the land since before the Civil War, over 100 years ago. Before they can focus on the MPP, they have to get the nod at the convention. But as the net drags on, and ballot after ballot shows little movement between Goldwater and Glenn, finally one of the few favorite sons left on the ballot. They're only only there because some delegates hoped against hope that that their chosen candidate could serve as a compromised candidate finally folded. And with the last ballot, the result is clear. <clears throat> um, Debate with Goldwater, debate with Goldwater, Glenn... Um, honestly, with Barry Goldwater, we could go crazy, maybe, with economics. And with Glenn, he just wants space stuff. Uh, 
I we're I'm gonna choose Wallace probably in the end anyways. Even if he doesn't win, like I want to make sure that we can like pass. I want to do full Wallace, ca you know, campaign here. So <clears throat> I want to do very Goldwater later on. I want to really focus on Goldwater much later on. So we'll go with John Glenn because he's probably not well known. Well known. Now, you, can say, you can say the same thing about Barry Goldwater, though, maybe, but I'm going to do John Glenn for now, so. <clears throat> He's probably a little bit more inexperienced than, you know, Wallace, even though he was governor of Ohio, so. All right, anything here that we need to know about? Uh, can we suppress R's and D's, perhaps? That'd be kind of nice. Yeah, we can. Nice. Don't just report. Uh, let's re diminish Republican support first, and then do some uh, Democrats. Nice. Business subsidies. Jobs Act. Polls are updated. Oh, actually, I want to see the polls here. Let's see. Uh, the Deep South is still up in the air. That's not really good for us. Oh, man. East Coast. Oh, man. This is not looking good for us at all. Uh, toss up. Toss up. Progressive primaries. With a lot of cheers and celebrations on the floor of the Miami Beach Convention Center in Miami Beach. The floor has greeted George Wallace as I formally accept the nomination of the MPP to run for a second term as a U president of the U.S. of America. As the first White House occupant to be neither an R or D since Mill... Millard Fillmore left in 1853. It was only natural that George Wallace would get another crack at four more years in the highest office in America. The two primary challengers, Senator Margaret J. Smith of Maine, representing a new business-oriented faction of the far-right MPP, and CNPP leader Michael Harrington, both seeking to bring the party and the nation more in line with the preferred path. However, neither won more than a handful of delegates in the primaries, and both were overshadowed by the current president's popularity and leadership within the party. Now that George Wallace has secured the nomination with a little in the way of opposition. The plan is now to face Republican Democrats and ensure that the past four years wasn't a fluke in American political theory or history, but start of a new party system. Four more years. Aw, oh, yeah. Yeah, the West Coast loves us. Holy crap. That's awesome. We got two more days left. Unhappy, unhappy. Play up our achievements. I don't want... I don't want that to happen. A solid, nice. A solid campaign. Um. Yeah, they're unhappy, unhappy. Hopefully they can just remain unhappy in, while we try to do more... For us, let's see. Cutting a deal. Nope. Social Security, healthcare reform. We might get to that in the next uh, term for Wallace. So we'll see what happens. Uh, let's see. Political landscape. Can we do this? Yep. We're willing to work well together. Nope. Oh, look at that. Nice. Yeah. Do the Democrats next. Nice. It is July, so. Gotta keep an eye on this. Uh, let's see. Actually, business subsidies and the Jobs Act. And I don't know if we need to do this one next. Repeal, go populist. Now, we can do the land of cotton, helping Dixie, the underprivileged states uh, program, segregate the job score, expand unemployment subsidies. Hurrah, hurrah, the American dream. I kind of want to do this towards the Steel Belt, though, just because of the NPP will have a better reputation in the Steel Belt and Midwest. Big business hates that. But we create the CCCs, we get more cost, whatever. And we can court the center, and it grows more unified and looks better in northern states, which I really want to do. And we do need to get down here as well. The union makes us strong. So we're going to do foreign businesses next, maybe? Mm, now we'll do the Jobs Act. The American dream has always been that of any man can achieve prosperity through hard work and determination. Consequently, we will never get over our post-war malaise until we can get our unemployed youth into the workforce. President Wallace once again has a plan for that. We'll also draft a bill to create the Jobs Corps, a federal program that offers free of charge education and vocational training to young people aged 20, 16 to 24. This will allow young men and women of low income and good character to get the training they need to pursue a fulfilling career path, from welding to nursing to a seamanship. Jobs, Wallace's Jobs Corps will allow the young down and outs to find the calling in their life. MLK assassinated. Oh, boy. Horrible news has just come out of Memphis, Tennessee. Just after 6 in the evening, civil rights leader Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was shot while taking with colleagues, talking with colleagues, on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel. The bullet fired from a boarding house across the street. Entered through his cheek, smashing his jaw, penetrating into his spinal cord. Dr. King was rushed to St. Joseph's Hospital, where he was pronounced dead just an hour later. In a short address to the press at St. Joseph's, Jesse Jackson, the well-known organizer and ally of Dr. King, mourned the fallen activist, claiming that Dr. King died in his arms, Jackson stated. This tragedy must not be a mere partisan issue, but one that unites us all. Sons and daughters of God to a higher calling. This is out of control. Oh, boy. Oh, go and do that. And let's see. East Coast is really a toss-up. Wow. Um, RD, uh, mm, East Coast is really RD. Deep South, Upper South. One, two, really, maybe we'll do the Deep South for now? We'll do Deep South and maybe the Rockies. There we go. Unhappy, just keep it unhappy. The Dream Act only finds nightmares and congressional failure. Wait, hold on. Hold on. Uh, Let's see. If you like to read about this failure, you know what? Let me see if I can change something up here. All right, everyone. So, I went back and 
I didn't. I decided not to go down the route where we just fail with passing jobs. But we're doing foreign businesses right now. Wiser men than I have said that America's business is business. That matter. That no matter who you are, where you came from, America always had its doors open, ready to make a deal. Guns, cars, pig iron, bread, playboys, you name it. We have it. No questions asked. For the better part of two centuries that have been our state of affairs, selling the excess of our plenty to anyone and everyone who wanted it, because of that, we prospered and grew where others killed it over and fell. It died an ugly death when the Depression hit us all, but the most darning was that the Democrats buried it under tariff after tariff without a second thought. So to the American people, I promise this. The good old days are coming back, and we will soon reap the riches that follow. And to all the free nations of the world, I promise this. Our doors are always open. Our bounties always free to purchase. Come on in with the cash on hand, and let's make a deal. So, I still did lower business taxes, so that's still the same. We have lower incomes, so whatever. Uh, alienated the CNPP, whatever. But we did not do business subsidies or jobs acts, because both of these failed. And we don't want to do that. And instead, I'll focus on trying to get to the union makes us strong. Cool. Let's do... Canadian businesses because we grow a little more unified. <clears throat> well, business transactions with strangers work fine enough. Business transactions with friends have the added benefit of lasting far longer, and there is no better example of a friend to America than our neighbor Canada. We've always enjoyed warm trade relations with the Great White North, much to the displeasure of the Great Light British Empire. Canadian oil and precious metals freely cross the longest shared land border on Earth on a regular basis, and in return for American cars, heavy equipment, and foodstuffs are unloaded daily on the busy docks of Quebec, Toronto, and Vancouver. Ours is a relationship that spans a hundred years and hundreds of millions of dollars, ultimately contributing to the prosperity of everyone involved, through increases in our exports to and imports from Canada. We can strengthen these ties enough to last for at least another generation, as we're still trying to make sure that we... Win the upcoming elections. Images from a funeral, <clears throat> a simple farm wagon, brown and faded green, pulled by a pair of mules through the streets of Atlanta. Dignitary celebrities, men and women of all faiths, gathered in a church as Ralphie Abernathy remarks on one of the darkest hours of mankind. A hundred thousand people crowd in the three and a half miles of roadway watching the procession go by. Coretta Scott King, Jesse Jackson, Andrew Young, Ju John Lewis, Walter Reuther. Mahalia Jackson singing, Take My Hand, Precious Lord. More tears and grief than any human mind could possibly comprehend. At the end, everyone sings We Shall Overcome, and everyone prays that they will someday. And I apologize if I'm rereading things over again, because I can't remember. I tried this again, and then I had to reload the game a second time. To see what was going on. So, questioning the dream. The poor man drives home from his daily grind at the auto factory. His next payday is weeks away and he wonders if he'll be able to eat until then. He questions why he can barely afford the necessities while his rude, lazy supervisor owns a second car and a vacation home in Florida. Com commiserating his, lof his lot in life, he turns on the radio another man speaks, his, loud, his voice loud and commanding. He decries the state of America the squeeze of workers, that squeezes the worker dry while funneling the, wealthy toward, the wealth towards the upper classes. He calls for the wealth that belongs to the people to return to the people. The poor man listens to his words intently all the way home. A university student poor over her essay on Lincoln on American history, knowing that her professor will scold her for how unpatriotic it is. As a girl, she she believed that her nation was the greatest in the world, but after reading what scarce few books she could find about the history of native genocide and the Red Scare and the legacy of Jim Crow, she found it hard to feel any sense of pride anymore. She spies a leaflet pinned to a cork board on the walls, advertises a student ac activist group claiming to preach the real sordid history of America. After some musing, she sets out to attend its first meeting. The black man had been politely turned away from some office or actively left out of, out of others. Finally, he finds someone who will take him seriously. The white man greets him warmly and asks him about his previous experiences. He talks about his days as a lawyer, primarily defending civil rights activists and the poor downtrodden, and the official listens to him patiently. After a lengthy interview, both are smiling. The left NPP is coming into the light, and a black lawyer and defender of civil liberties is exactly the type of person they'd like to put on the ballot. Something is changing in America. The ideal of the American dream is no longer taking hold of the illustrious once did, and anger is beginning to mount. Decades of broken promises are finally catching up to this country, and unless something changes, the people may well return to ideas once considered anathema. The system begins to crack. And we have five more days for this, so not too bad. And the current debt is not bad, under $80 billion. Not bad. Oh, come on, guys. An uninspired campaign? We don't need stuff like that here. Let's take out some uh, Spanish or Iberian terrorists. Thank you. Best of luck to them. Awesome. And I do want to read about Australasian businesses. With the fall of China, French Indochina, and the Southeast Asian colonies, America's once domineering sway over the most populous region on Earth came to an end. From Beijing to Batavia, American investments, trade agreements, loans, company shares, overseas branches were written off or dissolved against our will. Untold millions that lasted generations. 
Testament to our nation's economic and financial prowess. Swept away by a horde of Japs in a little more than four years. But Uncle Sam is far from out. Broken and bruised, yes, but never out. While Hong Kong kowtowed to the Japanese Aibatsu, Canberra closed an entire continent shut from them. While Japan's newest puppets expelled her businesses and her businessmen, Sydney offered them safe harbor. While all of Asia turned to yen, Australia, Australasia look, alone kept true to its dollar. Twelve million is a far cry from one billion to whom we used to sell, but that number remained loyal customers when everyone else jumped ship. If we reestablish America's presence in the Asia Pacific, fostering better trade relations with our ally down under is the best place to start. Nice. That will skyrocket, and that's okay. Uh, East Coast is pretty much lost. Deep South might be lost. I don't know. I mean, you can't trust a lot of the uh, poles here. Rockies, Great Plains. I think I want to do the Great Plains, maybe, if we haven't done them yet. I mean, if we did them last, eh, we can do Deep South. Why not? I, I heard that you can't lose the Deep South. If you want to read about the Space Odyssey, you could have gone right ahead. But I'm sorry. It happens every campaign. Like I said, uh, you can't. I can't remember if we've gone through that or not, but I've seen that like three or four or five times already, so it's nothing super important, so... Uh, toss up. Deep South, not too bad. Yeah, we want to do East Coast next. That's not too bad, actually. Uh, can England, New England. Ooh. I don't want to lose too much support here, though. Canadian businesses are nice. And can we do anything about R&Ds here? No, we can do this one, though. Make sure the Germans don't interfere with us. Good. Australasian businesses. Good. And it'll be done in 18 days. A concordat with Canada. Oh, debate with John Glenn. But Fulbright and Wallace once again were busy negotiating terms and propositions of yet another treatise to be delivered to foreign powers. Quite relaxed due to the subject matter in question. The U.S. economy relied on oil which fueled cars, factories, and businesses. And if it was oil it needed, why not get it from a close ally for a good price? Sounds like a good, good idea. To Prime Minister John Diefenbacher of the Great Canadian People. The government of the Canadian people and the federal government of the U.S. have a unity unlike that ever seen across the globe. From fighting in the trenches against the Germans in France during the First World War to the defense of the British Isles led by the American and Canadian men, the bravest and gallantry of our people have shaped the modern understanding of North America. However, once more, as the collapse of alliances failed around the world against the Germans and Japanese, once more does a lack of unity threaten us all against the coercions of the Japanese in the Pacific, and the organization of free nations will not fall in the face of evil. Thus, we shall organize an immediate increase in the importation of Canadian oil by 175%. In order to benefit the American civilian and military economies while helping to shape the petroleum industry within the Canadian economy. While the drastic nature of the upscale importation may seem rushed and immediate, it is within the best interest of both our countries and our liberties to do so under the threat of the Japanese army and the naval forces as they grow throughout the Pacific. The U.S. shall begin preparations immediately to receive the petroleum offered by the wonderful people of Canada in such a time of strike and fear. With great thanks to the President, to the Government and People of Canada, George C. Wallace, President of the U.S. The day after Canada's ratification of the trade proposal, J. William Fulbright once more approached President Wallace and looked confused as to why the Secretary Fulbright approached him until he offered the President a thumbs up and request for orders. Give him heck, George. Give him heck. Cool. Nice. Goes a little more, a little more unified. And power do, begins to get a little better. Debate with John Glenn. Uh, Governor John Glenn and President George Wallace walks, walks shortly. And slowly, almost reluctantly, towards each other, seeming to only touch palms briefly before turning to the podiums. Wallace's segregationism had viciously angered nearly everyone in the North, a sentiment shared by Glenn. Wallace, for his part, barely held a sneer at the latest Northern carpetbagger looking to tread on his beloved South. A debate, predictably, centered on the question of civil rights, and Glenn did not hold back. President Wallace, I cannot understand why you insist on segregation in the 20th century. By what right do you seek to deny good, honest Americans their rights? Governor, I'm not surprised by utopian dreams. Having gone to space and back, Wallace replied acidly, Come back to Earth, Governor. We are union of states, and my constituents demand that their rights be respected. Whose rights, President Wallace? I'll make this simple. Do you stand by what you said three years ago, Glenn Snap? A second pass, an eternity on stage. Wallace's eyes widened for a brief instant, and then narrowed hardened. Segregation now. Segregation tomorrow. Segregation forever. Yes, I do. Voters side with Wallace, because that's the way we were going to go. Um, the kid just said freedom, but, you know, whatever. Freedom for people to live as how they choose and who they interact with. That probably would have been better for him to say, but hey, I ain't Wallace. 68. Oh, we already did this earlier, so we'll tell him. I forgot about that. Yeah. Technology, cut down that debt. Thank you very much. Um, Let's see. 68. We're pretty good on a lot of things here, actually. Uh, artillery, maybe? Uh, that's a little bit ahead of time. Not that ahead of time. We need support weapons. And then we shall do some... Oh, M72 laws. Nice. That does not look like a law, but what do I know? Australasian businesses, sign us up. Iberian businesses, very nice. Operation success. Among the triumvirate, Iberia is easily the closest to the U.S. A chink in the armor, or the otherwise firm grips Germany and Italy have on the market. 
of Europe. Easy access to American lines of credit helped keep the country's economy solvent and barely following the construction of the Gibraltar Dam and its repercussions. Additionally, recent tensions with its ostensible allies meant that Iberian businessmen were gradually shifting their eyes away from the inter-Mediterranean and towards the transatlantic. Our economic advisors believe that now is the perfect time to expand the reach of American trade into Iberia and consequently southern Europe. A trade agreement here, some words of encouragement there, and soon enough our companies will be making Iberian pesos hand over fist. Oh, I hope so. I really hope so. Alright. Uh, things are probably not going to go well for us, but no matter what, we'll probably win, hopefully, anyways, so... Toss up, toss up. Yeah, the East Coast is not looking good. Uh, let's go to the toss up with the East Coast. I don't know what point of doing any of that. Super Tyrannus, whatever it was. Super sick. Cool. And, cool, I did want to get down to deregulate D.C., but, and then that's with Australia. President William J. William, F President Wallace, William J. Fulbright, and a team of diplomats had assembled together to scrutinize a piece of international trade legislation that had been developed by the President and Secretary. Every line had to be right here, to ensure that the delivery of the message would echo the same throughout the Pacific to any who dare call the members of the OFN foes. To Prime Minister Harold Holt of the Commonwealth of Australia, it is with the utmost importance that we secure trade, secure trade connection with the free markets of both the U.S. of A. as well as the Commonwealth of Australia in order to maintain a safe and prosperous future for Australians and Americans alike. No, New Zealanders, apparently. Together, our people suffered from the sins committed by the Japanese forces across the Pacific with the blood of our compatriots fallen into the chronicles of history, soiling the palms of Japanese soldiers and officers. It is with great honor that we not only wish to guarantee such a trade agreement with the Australian government for the sake of the horrors of the past, but also in order to lay the foundation of a greater, more secure foundation of our nation economies in conjunction with one another. The Federal Department of State has reviewed the prospects of Australia, Australian continent and found a variety of wondrous opportunities available to connect the two of our countries into a sense of brotherhood in an already brightening future. Thus, it is my honor to announce a new opening of the American market toward Australian, Australian, Australian goods. Most specifically, the American government is seeking to increase the purchase of Australian steel and steel-related goods by tenfold current estimates. Thus, Australi Australian markets would flourish with the influx of American investments into the Commonwealth's economy, while the U.S. can both direct the steel to American production and military sectors, as well as introductions to the private sector of American business. To only together, along with the entirety of the OFM, may we prosper against a future shielded from the Empire of Japan's encroachments. With many thanks and cheers to the Austra Australian Commonwealth and people, George C. Wallace, President of the U.S. Australia promptly accepted the terms under Wallace's treaty, prompting outrage from the wording of the letter from Japanese diplomats. Nice. Even better poverty. And we're going to deregulate DC next. Regulations, regulations, regulations. They come in many shapes and sizes, different names from different people. Liberals and pinkos call them environmental protection and workers' rights. Nazis call them efficient redistribution of the fear's money. But rational men see the past of smoke and mirrors and find mounts of red tape, ready to choke the lights out of anyone who dares to found their own little business. Become their own masters, like loyal must they follow the feds wherever they go, ruining the lives of many an honest entrepreneur at home, and many an honest, honest entrepreneur from abroad. See, right now America needs every last dollar it can get to survive the next decade. Dollars to build roads and bridges, dollars to pay our men and buy our guns, dollars to grow wheat in the plains and feed the American people. Feed the American people. Right now, outside our borders, there's a whole mountain of cash ready to flow like manna straight into America's balancing sheet. B building all the roads, bridges, farms, and factories we want. All we need to do is loosen up a little bit, nothing too harmful, just some minor readjustments uh, here and there, and all that capital will be ours for the taking simple stuff, right? Glad you agree. Cool, so... I'll do that anyways, it's fine. It's just a little bit ahead of time. Cool. Man, I hope we can do do okay here. I really do. And if it doesn't, then I'll, I'll, I'll fix some things up off screen to make sure that we do relatively okay. Uh, we still can't build anything else here. Any nuclear reactors? Oh, yeah. At Folsom Prison. Look at that, nice. Nuclear reactors, why not? Their ways were filled with cheers and applause from the inmates of Folsom Prison today as Johnny Cash's new live album at Folsom Prison hit the shelves. The album was recorded live at a concert Cash performing at Folsom Pri State Prison in California. It's a runaway success. The album sold out records, stores across the nation, and Folsom Prison Blues has shot up to number one on Billboard's Top 40. Johnny Cash shed much of his former outlaw image after getting help for his amphetamine addiction in 1967, but he's not given up his passion for incarcerated Americans with former President Nixon and, the fur uh, and his advocacy for the rights. Cash had several meetings with former President Nixon in the early 60s about prison reform and expressed interest in meeting with the President Wallace as well. The uh, album's lyrics reflect the harsh and alienating conditions of prison life and the yearnings of prisoners to break free and return to their loved ones. This album may have reinvigorated Cash's previously ailing career, and Columbia Records has suggested that a future live album might be recorded at San Quentin state prison. Whatever the future may hold for the man in black, this album has clearly captivated the hearts and minds of the nations for years to come. How old is man to go to prison in California for a murder in Nevada anyway? That's your diplomacy. Solid. Good. A solid campaign is always good to see. 
Especially since it's November 5th. Holy crap. Operational success. That's good. Well, can't do much here. So, all right. The warning. The Stonewall Inn is a spot of light and loud laughter in the world slipping into autumn. The sounds of occasional retching aside, the inn is a good place, and the crowds know it to be far more than just a building. For many, it's patrons. It's the only place that can truly be themselves, but autumn sweeping in one chill breeze at a time. The signs have been there for a long while, the mayor riding in on the coattails of the moral cleanup movement sweeping the country, and the officers sent to the collection duties. One calls it the offering bag with only a hint of irony. From the inn tell the bartenders of the anti-mafia team they're forming in the back of the Metropolitan Department. It's not like the community they formed here hasn't known the wrath of cops, but this time it'll be different. Changes come to America, and the, as the president says over the airwaves, but some changes are less welcome than others. The bartender methodically cleans his cups half an hour before closing down. They'll take care of the mess in the toilets afterwards, and there's always a mess in the toilets. He got hired by the Don, same as all his staff, but he comes to love the place. The patrons are gaudy and have a glint in their eyes, but it's the real life they're living here in the damp spaces. He looks at a sleeping customer hunched over his cups and smiles wanely. Whatever happens next, he'll stay with the ship, even if the hole's leaking. His passengers deserve nothing less. Hope glows, and the day glows, grows grim. Grim. Oh, Jilko reelected. Nice. Class selections. Okay, so what happened? Holy crap, okay. Election season again. The Republicans lost eight Senate seats. The Democrats got two. The Senate lost one. And the far right got seven more. Holy crap. I thought we wouldn't do as well. Wow, the Deep South really got hurt. But not too badly, actually. It's not actually not too bad. Look, this is holy crap. We got seven more far right senators. Screw the, the center. The Republicans and D's. The, oh, my goodness. Election day, 1968. Oh, my goodness. <sighs> President Wallace is one. If you like to read about this, go right ahead, but... Oh, good God, that's nice. England, Scotland, Wharf, nice. Now, my goal is to deregulate DC, because I think I spent a little bit too much time on this side. Honestly, United and Ready, I think I, I spent a little bit too much time with the focuses down that way. So, well, we could deregulate DC. We could do stuff over here. I mean, my, I was trying to get to the Union makes us strong, but it is what it is. But, you know, with all that support, and with all them senators won, uh... Wow. All right. Yeah, that's not bad. That is... That is not bad. Look at that. They're unhappy, but... Look at the elections for the presidency. 46 for the Republican Democrats and 492 for the NPP. Holy crap, that is good. Oh, my goodness. Let's help Iberia, shall we? Help them beat up some terrorists. All right. Well, if that's the case... We're going to get started with the dirty state of school and screw everything else. The state of American education system has been brought to the shows. Not even the well-being of our children is sacred to the perfidious progressive. Overburdened with central Washington interventionism. Their curricula and even administration distorted to the diktat of leftist social engineering. We need to tear this atrocious system down and replace it with proper America once and for all. For the sake of our children. A union with the union. Secretary of State William J. Fulbright and President Wallace has been in the Oval Office from sunrise to sunset. However, one of the key steps in revolutionizing American trade policy to prevent Japanese dominance was forming. And the two were planning on diving into the belly of the beast to do it. As it set forward the official statement to the Caldillos of the Iberian Union. Rightful rulers of the Portuguese and Spanish men alike. With regards to handling of foreign trade policy, the U.S. of America is seeking to emphasize the protection of interests for itself and nations throughout the world. This is why the Department of State has decided to approach both of you in proposing an alliance of trade security between the two of our nations. While the Germans have continuously impacted the state of the Union's economy, the Japanese regularly tear down our economic securities, thus prompting the following plan drafted by the most brilliant trade analysis the U.S. has to offer, in addition for the growth and spread of American-based biz businesses in the, into the Iberian Union to stimulate economic sources from metropolitan and suburban areas. The U.S. will officially work to scale the importation of raw steel materials from the Iberian Union by 150%. This will allow a raw financial boost towards the Iberian economy in exchange as the U.S. hopes for the Caldeus to downscale the ongoing trade relations with the Empire of Japan to secure a more positive economic outlook for Iberians and Americans alike. With complete respect and honor towards your rule, George C. Wallace, President of the United States. In the days following the securing of the trade alliance with Salazar and Franco, the RDs, especially that Barry Goldwater, tore into President Wallace for daring to associate Americans with the likes of fascist dictatorships. However, President Wallace thought, they didn't get the first holiday inn built on the coast of Barcelona, did they? No one likes to listen, listen to Wallace, huh? Well, they better start listening. Actually, let's take a look at this before we end the episode. We have poverty relief going up by three months. Not bad. But I hope you enjoyed this episode. It's been a wild ride, and I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, leave a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow. When we have another fun time with George C. Wallace. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.